So just like the Jews missed it with the first coming, expecting the second coming, they're gonna miss it again at the beginning of the tribulation. The third temple is not Yeshua's temple. The third temple is the tribulation temple. And the fourth temple is Yeshua's temple. Ezekiel chapter 43 declares that the presence of God, the glory returns in the fourth temple, Yeshua's millennial temple. Supporting the third temple is thrusting us into the tribulation. We are so glad you've joined us today. We are on number six, our program on the yes. roadmap to Armageddon. It's all about the third temple, That's which right. is ready to go, isn't it? Everything's Everybody kinda. thinks it's ready to go. I mean, this is the Jewish dream come true, and it, its construction of a third temple is prophesied. It's going to happen, but little do people know this is also the culmination of Satan's lifelong dream, what he's going to do in that temple. A lot of people get confused thinking that they should support the construction of this, that this is the temple the Messiah is going to sit on. False. Mm. They also believe that they can speed along Yeshua's return by forcing prophecy. Also yeah, false. very interesting. <laughs> a lot of people feel that. Yes. They do feel yeah. that they can do that, but they can't. Today we're going to discuss like what's going to happen in this third temple. We're going to discuss all the pagan worship. We're going to discuss the pagan worship in the one world order. It's, it's going to get intense. Yeah. And I believe all of that takes place in Jerusalem. 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 <laughs> yes. Hmm. Let's go there right now. God. <laughs> I don't get it. It's supposed to be Shabbat. How can I rest if they've got this big fence I can't climb over? Uh, come over here. We'll find some other no, place to chillax. You heard what the man said. I heard, I heard. I'm just glad we finally got a day off. We can relax in Shabbat. Yes. I wanted what? to relax in the pool. Wait, what is it? Oh, no. It's Jeff. No, I don't care if he's calling it. I still got like four hours left to Shabbat. Well, hey, we were supposed to talk about the third temple today. <sighs> Brother, we don't need to worry about that. All those red heifers, consider them blemished. They're not gonna be incinerated anytime soon. Josh, they cannot build the third temple by just having red heifers. There are steps it takes, such as the peace treaty signed by the beast and his enemies. We're oh, gonna yeah. have to check Jeff out. This is All important. Right, fine, play the video. All right. I've been a college professor for years, guys, and I have met students and they come out of relationships saying, I've been fooled, I've been deceived, I didn't know who they were, but I sure found out. Well, the world's going to be deceived. But don't be deceived about this. We live in a time where the temple is, is in, in the throes of reconstruction, actually. There's energies, there's interests to build that temple. And the great deceiver is going to go there, there atop the Temple Mount. Gentlemen, take us there and tell that story. You heard Jeff. Yeah, right after the hot tub. No, go get dressed. We gotta go tell the story. All right, all right. And now we will serenade you with our wonderful travel music, which we sing to maintain our sanity during Jerusalem's high traffic environments. <laughs> Getting the front of a Jeep. Dun, dun, dun. So you know it's a Jeep. It is a Jeep. And we're driving in a Jeep. Look at this Jeep. And it is a Jeep. Uh, 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 so Jeep. cool. Jeep. 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 So, so much manliness. Jeep. Oh, 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 Jeep. Oh, oh. Look at our manliness. Come on. Ah! Hebrew words of anger. Hebrew words of impatience. Guys, over the last two years in the BBB, we have not shied away from our opinion of opposition against this third temple. And against you Christians out there, we love you, don't fund it, all right? I get it, it's confusing. The third temple is not Yeshua's temple. The third temple is the tribulation temple, and the fourth temple is Yeshua's temple. That's very important, guys. I know some Christians think that they can force prophecy ahead, and if they get the Jews to rebuild the third temple, then here comes Yeshua in the rapture and all your problems are solved. But not for the Jewish people, their problems are just beginning when that occurs. Guys, this is about saving their eternal souls, not trying to fulfill your, your dreams of going to heaven. You're gonna get there, but for Jews, a lot of bad's gonna happen once that third temple is built. But the most important thing to address is this, guys. Construction cannot begin on the third temple until the beast ratifies a peace treaty with Israel and her enemies. Hey, we made it. 
Daniel 9.24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel's 70 weeks is the ultimate roadmap to Armageddon. So here's Daniel. He's chilling in captivity. He's reading the book of Jeremiah and he's wondering, when is this 70 years of exile going to come to an end? He seeks the Father for this answer. He humbles himself and because he humbles himself, the Father sends the angel Gabriel to reveal to him the end of time. That's crazy, wow. guys. We're, we're here right now on the Mount of Olives. Directly across from us is Har Habayit, the Temple Mount. Mount Moriah is where everything goes down, guys. Jerusalem is the key to Daniel's 70 weeks. Now, a week is not your traditional seven days in a week. They also, it represents uh, a day for a year. So one week is seven years. And so you look at how it was fulfilled in the past. When the call came out to rebuild Jerusalem, that was 457 uh, BC. Then 69 weeks would elapse until Messiah Yeshua was cut off in 32 AD. That's a total of 483 years. That leaves one week left. But the, the timetable, the hourglass, stopped at that moment and it wouldn't start up again until Daniel 927. Oh, I get it. I get it. We are going to get hated on because we started off bashing the third temple in this episode. Oh, guess what? Now we're doing math, but not just any math, Jewish math, the worst math of all kind. You're welcome. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Daniel 9:27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. As you can hear behind me, we are in Jerusalem. There is a myriad of sounds going on, prayer calls, traffic, generally sounding like everybody's trying to outdo each other, brother. That's true, but back to Daniel's 70 weeks. You know, the, the week begins again, as you read in that scripture, when the beast ratifies a peace treaty with Israel and her enemies. Right now, we're living in an age or epic of the church time. You know, it began in 32 AD with Shavuot, the day of Pentecost, and it ends uh, on the day of the rapture, when the bride is taken up to be with Messiah. But that last seven years uh, is very uh, tumultuous time. It's the time of the tribulation. In Revelation chapter four and on, we get these trumpets, these bowls of wrath, these, these seals being broken, and all that chaos happens in these seven years, the last week of being. At first, this seems like a great idea for the Jewish people. They finally get to rebuild the temple without having to go through World War III. They've just been through it with Gog and Magog, so they're excited. Mm. Construction begins on the Temple Mount, and in 220 days, they have the third temple, the Beit Hamikdash. Well, how do you know it's in 220 days? Oh, that's a good point. Well, great. Math. Again. Well, Daniel 8.14 gives us a very specific timetable from the beginning of the offering and sacrifices in the third temple to the time that Yeshua comes and vindicates the Abomday temple, we get 2,300 days. So it's math time, guys, okay? Get okay. your thinking caps on. A Jewish year is 360 days. You take that seven years times 360, you get 25, 20 days. Now you subtract the 2,300 days and you get the 220 days, the day that the temple is inaugurated and sacrifices and offerings begin. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13. Thus says the Lord of hosts saying, behold the man whose name is the branch from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13 is why the Jews believe Mashiach will build this temple. But that passage actually refers to the fourth temple, not the third temple. So just like the Jews missed it with the first coming, expecting the second coming, they're gonna miss it again at the beginning of the tribulation. You see, there has to be a mediator to act on behalf of the Jewish people to shake hands with the beast that ratifies this peace treaty. He's gonna be an Assyrian goy representing the nations, but this, this Jewish mediator is going to be the Mashiach to them. He's gonna say he's from the tribe of Judah, descendant of King David, and he's gonna be, begin the rebuilding of a third temple. But he's gonna be a false messiah. Zar HaMashiach, 
and the, the things that this man does is going to lead to the deaths of countless Jews greater than that of World War II during the Holocaust. Now we have interviewed many rabbis from the Temple Institute and they all say the same thing. The tenth heifer will be processed by the Messiah according to the Jewish sages. But that Messiah, the third temple, is actually the false prophet. Not to ruin the whole soberness of that statement, but why does the false prophet get to handle the red heifer? He gets to cook like the rarest hamburger in 2,000 years, well done, like incinerated to ash? So we wonder to ourselves, what would it be like if we were in charge of cooking the red heifer? Hey everybody, I'm Joshua. And I'm Caleb. And we're here yeah, to host the DVD's newest venture here in Israel. Quality, quality time. time. That's, That's right. right, spend quality time with your loved ones with a burger. God's chosen food for you in Israel. Sponsored by the Bearded Bible Brothers with cheese or no cheese if you're kosher. But no pork. We get goose. Goose bacon. Keep it clean, kids. Don't do drugs. Sponsored by the BBB, Bearded Bible Brothers. How does that prevent drug use? I don't know, it's like you wipe yourself clean and then you're sin free. Yeah. Revelation 13, 11, 13 and 14. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So the false prophet will actually be the true antichrist to the Jewish people. He will set himself up as the Messiah. He will rule from Jerusalem. Everything will seem kosher until all of a sudden it's not. He'll most likely come from the tribe of Dan, which was cursed. He will be Nephilim, which means he is a beast just as the first beast was. Yeah. And then, then he will masquerade as the Lamb of God. Mm. Revelation 13, 14, he, the false prophet, deceives my own people who dwell on the earth because of the signs he was granted to do in front of the beast. Guys, it's kind of interesting. Most translation says, he deceives those who dwell on the earth, this false prophet. But some of the more ancient Greek manuscripts add another word, emos, of my, uh, in between uh, tus and katoi kuntas, which means he uh, deceives those of my people dwelling on the earth. It matches what Paul says in Acts uh, 20 uh, when he talks about my own people. So it would be interesting, Josh, if John the Apostle who is writing this is referencing the false prophet deceiving the Jewish people when he comes on the scene. Well, today, the Jewish people worship at the Western Wall. It's the closest location they can get to the former temple. <laughs> it's actually very important uh, that the third temple is built for the whole house of Israel because they have to partake in a sacrifice and offering system that they hadn't for over 2,000 years in order that they may recognize and see that Yeshua has already fulfilled it. And for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Jews are actually having a pretty good time for once in their life, people aren't trying to destroy them but that all ends at day 1260. Guys, it's pretty ironic that when the house of Israel, every single Jew is finally recognized, mm. the God of Israel worshiping, the rest of the world's gone full pagan, not even half pagan, yeah. full, pagan. full pagan. They've all decided to worship in this one world style religion yeah. and worship that whore of Babylon. The whore of Babylon, the one world religion, terrible. Mm. Wow, I hope we don't get censored for this episode. We just said whore like a gazillion times but it was in the correct biblical context. Revelation 17, one through two, come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Then the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This religion is not the worship of the beast at first, or at least I suspect. Mm. I think it's more of a revised Babylonianism, uh, the original worship that Nimrod instituted when he placed himself as Marduk the god, mm. as they began to worship these Nephilim hybrid creatures who set themselves up. Yeah. Um, I believe that at the end, what you'll see is that people begin to look at these creatures 
almost as aliens, gods, you yeah. know, establishing even more strength in those 10 king superpowers to unify them. That's true, guys. They might come in the form of aliens or progenitors. The whole world is being set up for that moment right now. I know back during the Sumerian times, they came as the Anunnaki, this visage of half animal, half man hybrids, and they demanded that man worship him. But uh, when you look throughout all of history, you see these murals, these images of gods and goddesses, demigods, giants. I believe you should take it for what they are. Egypt and Rome and, and the Greeks. I believe that Satan and these demonic entities manifested physically in this visual form. And so when you read in Daniel chapter 11 about this God of fortresses that they first worship, that the beast reveres, I believe that they're probably coming in this kind of physical form and being worshiped. Let's read the scripture of Daniel chapter 11, 38. It says, he, the beast, shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God which he shall acknowledge and advance his glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. I find it interesting in this passage, our Hebrew sensei Shaul confirmed for us that there are two different gods that are described in the original Hebrew. Two gods, a god of fortresses or towers like Nimrod's Babel, the ziggurat, and a god his fathers did not know. After those three and a half years, what happens, brother? Well, after three and a half years, that's when it begins, that worship of a beast. Um, I believe he betrays those demons that he promised so long ago that they would have that throne, that seat of power, and, and everything changes. All, all bets are off. And there's an interesting scripture that goes into that detail. Revelation 17, 16 through 17. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. It's ironic that Satan gives the fallen angels, the Nephilim disembodied spirits, what he promised them at the rebellion, a, a throne, worship. But he pulls a fast one <laughs> when he embodies the beast and takes all of the adoration and focus for himself. Yes. Revelation 11, one through two says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Guys, this is evidence, this scripture that there is indeed a third temple during the tribulation. Uh, many people like to whine and say, see, it says it's God's temple, so we have to support the building of the third temple. But in all actuality, the Jews only worship in this temple for 1,040 days. Then at the three and a half year point, the beast takes it over and he sits in that temple as his throne and gets worship. You know, Messiah, Yeshua, never goes into that temple. He will never rule from the third temple. Ezekiel chapter 43 declares that the presence of God, the glory returns in the fourth temple, Yeshua's millennial temple. This is why we're so strongly opposed to Christians just blindly supporting this idea of the third temple. Mm -hmm. Supporting the third temple is thrusting us into the tribulation, which means that Zechariah's prophecy that said two thirds of the Jew are gonna die at the tribulation, mm -hmm. the number is much larger of the casualties we're facing here. Yeah. If you really care about the Jews, if you love them, support them by reaching them with the message of Yeshua, yeah. support them by loving them. We have a short period of time in which we can reach all of the Jews and the Gentiles for Yeshua. Let's make that two thirds number as small as possible and oppose that third temple. Amen. Zechariah 13, eight. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. Though it seems impossible today that a third temple could be built because, well, there's only one side it could be built and it's currently occupied by squatters. Yeah. We know that the Muslims will never allow a temple to be put where their mosques are, a synagogue, a temple. That's right, guys. Something bad must happen to the Dome of the Rock and al Aqsa Mosque. It takes them off the mount. You know, Muslims have no problem blowing up each other's mosques, try to make a point. I suspect Gog and Magog may have a situation, you know, where it's collateral damage, or they're removed 
or moved uh, well enough to rally the Muslims uh, to blame the Jews for that problem. The scripture is clear. The, the temple is not going to be able to stand side by side on uh, the Temple Mount with those mosques. Revelation 11, 1 through 2 explains there's inner and outer courts as well. So it's not just, uh, can't be right next to it anyways. Well guys, it all comes to a head next week. The beast is assassinated and resurrected. And in his rage, Satan commits the abomination of desolation. Join us next week on Roadmap to Armageddon. Hello everyone, I'm here with Dr. Randall Price, and he is the foremost expert on all things temple and archaeological. And we're here, thank you just for, for being with us today. It's just an honor, Dr. Oh, my Dr. pleasure, Price. yeah. Well, everybody's getting excited because of these red heifers, you know, they're thinking, yes. okay, Jesus is coming back, we've got to force this to happen, sacrifice the red heifer, and then suddenly a temple is going to be built. That's not exactly the timing. Is there any timing scripturally we see when this next temple, the third temple, is going to be constructed? Daniel 9 gives us the time. It tells us mm -hmm. that there's going to be a, and it's higavir is the term it's used for the, for the habrit, but it's still strengthening a covenant or creating a new covenant or, you know, whatever term you have, yes. somehow there is a, a political diplomatic relationship formed between the man I would call the Antichrist yeah. and the, the leaders of Israel. Yes. Uh, in my scheme, I see Gog and Magog placed at Ezekiel where it's placed to give a promise that before uh, we have the restoration of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple, the, nation, the national uh, problem is taken care of. So the nations are removed. Yes. Uh, and that's what happens. Gog and Magog that's diffuses right. the whole thing. Yes. And there's a divine uh, defeat of these nations. Mm -hmm. Then it's a, and, and of course, probably America is off the picture by the time yep. the rapture of the church is taking place. Them, yeah. No. So the Western defense for Israel was removed, perfect vacuum for someone to step in yes. and say, look, you know, I, I know you want to rebuild your temple. This has been the goal you've had. It's a great thing. You'll honor the, the, the God who did this miraculous wow. thing. So, but you got a problem. You got, you got a lot of other hostile people still out there. Yeah. I'll safeguard you. I'll give you a deal here. Oof. I'll protect you. And they rebuild the temple. Yep. And he goes off to fight these other battles. But of course, his intention is to come back yes. and uh, take it for himself. And uh, only for the purpose of saying this massive deception that he has yes. to have himself ultimately worshiped. I just got to say, it's really fascinating to see you guys right there at the Temple Mount mm. filming. We've never been able to get right to it. How yeah. did you do that? Well, it was highly illegal and we're very small <laughs> oh, and not boy. noticeable. <laughs> I was going to say the illegal word and I'm like, do we go there? I, right. That's huge to do, especially yes. teaching a prophetic program about, from right there. About the Bible. Right. And so we, we employed a selfie stick and a, a sense of um, being tourists as we're pretending to take selfies and whatnot. Wow. But we needed to get the message out from the location that all of this is going to take place. That's right, guys. See, the third temple, the Beit HaMikdash Hashlishi, is not the Messianic temple. I know this is shocking for you guys. Yeshua will never rule and reign from there. He will never step foot in there. The Shekinah, the presence of God, does not return to that temple. But very important, I believe that the Ark of the Covenant will be there in that temple. The glory won't return, but the Ark of the Covenant has to be there. Okay, so uh, you, yeah. you did that in your teaching, and yeah. we're, we were both kind of like, ooh. Mm -hmm. So that means it is here on earth still. Because some people yeah. teach that the Ark is in heaven, all these different places. It has to return. Well, it does talk about Revelation. The real true Ark, the throne, the Kes Har Hamim, that mercy seat is in heaven. Um, they could recreate and rebuild an Ark of the Covenant, or they may find the original, but it has to be there for Satan to sit upon that mercy seat and declare himself to be God. Gosh, very Indiana Jones and mm, all very, of that, right? Well, this entire wow. time period has a, a, such a stark contrast of worship going on, black and white, good versus evil, yeah. this ancient Babylonian uh, worship that it comes back centered in Istanbul like it was before, but at the same time, the mosaic style of worship returns to the Temple Mount. Yeah. So you have this contrast of the way they worshiped in Moses' yeah. time and the way they worshiped in Babylonian times. And uh, there's all not- All blended.
all blended, blended, blended and happened at the same time. But what's not going to be there? The Dome of the Rock in Alaska. Mm. Uh, you can't be there with the Third Temple. And what I find most interesting, guys, is uh, this revived uh, Babylonianism, one world worship, is going to be pushed by the beast at first. Uh, he's going to fulfill his promise he gave to his fallen angels for them to have a throne and to be worshipped and have that adoration. Um, we read in Daniel 11, 37 through 38 um, that there's two forms of worship to two kinds of gods. These fallen angels could be uh, Nephilim, it could be um, the, our ancestors, aliens, you know, that he tries to push, you, the Anuaki. But there's also going to be a God he worships that his fathers didn't worship. Um, so you see that worship and praise and adoration that he's giving to these fallen angels. But then everything flips on its head um, at the three and a half year point where he sits upon a seat and declares worship to himself. And then everyone will hate that one world worship and turn against them. Mm. Ooh, lot, lot coming. Yeah. And yes. we want to continue our series. We have so many more series in the making to bring all of you. How do we do it? We are 100% funded by donations from people like you that watch our program. So I just want to say thank you in advance for more series coming our way. Yes. When we take you on tour with us, one of the places that we go, obviously, is Jerusalem. We spend about four or five days there and the Temple Mound is something that you see every day. It's spectacular. We would love for you to join us on a tour. You can find all the information on levitt.com. We will be right back. Our resource this week, the book, What Should We Think About Israel? How do you separate fact from fiction in the Middle East conflict? Theologian, archeologist, and research author, Randall Price provides objective facts about Israel's past, present, and future. Look past the heated debates and discern for yourself what is important to know about Israel and how that affects you today. Contact us and ask for the book, What Should We Think About Israel? Okay, gentlemen, next week, anything lighter? Does it get Kirsten, easier? I don't know why you have to do that. She knows what she's doing. Next week is my least favorite topic. If you watch Bearded Bible Brothers online, you know we talk about it all the time, way mm. too much. It's the abomination of desolation. Oh, wow. Somehow we can't seem to get away from that topic, brother. <laughs> a little heavy, just a little, a little heavy. Bit. Yeah. Wow. Still, it's been good today. Thank you for your teaching. Mm -hmm. We leave you now, but before we do that. Guys, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.